Okay. So welcome everyone to another another uh, lecture uh, on this C strategies and well eventually group words, but just C strategies for the moment. So I'm taking over from Karen just for this lecture, just because she's uh, away at a conference, but uh, she'll be back again next week. So where to start? Okay. So just a quick recap of what we were doing last week. So we looked at positive elements. So remember that, and we, we, there were several different ways of defining the positive elements. So one is simply as those which have, which are self-adjoint definitely, and which have their spectrum entirely contained within the, the positive real line, right? Including zero possibly, right? So these are, these you might say are, are non strictly positive. Even zero is considered as a positive element of your C star algebra. On the other hand, towards the end, Karen showed that actually, uh, alternatively, you can characterize the positive elements as all those guys which are of the form A star A, for some A, any A within your C star algebra, right? And, and in fact, part of that is, is due to the fact that every positive element has a unique square root. So another equivalent characterization of positive elements would be that they are precisely the squares of self-adjoint elements. So you have all these things, and these play a fundamental role in, in C star algebra theory. Uh, and, and one uh, number of important properties that they possess, for example, they form what's known as a, a convex cone. So they're closed under scalar multiplication, as long as you're dealing only with positive real scalars, right? It certainly won't be closed under multiplication by arbitrary complex scalars. And they're also closed under addition, right? Not, again, they're not closed under subtraction, but they are closed under addition. So these are also very important basic properties. Well, I think someone said something in the chat. Cannot see the screen. Uh, okay. Can you see the screen now? Is everyone? Uh, yes, okay, very good. Okay, so they form this convex cone. And what else? Uh, it's also a, what's known as sometimes a, as a proper cone. So if you look at the, the elements which are both positive and negative, so they're the, the additive inverse of some positive element, then in fact, there's only one of those. It's just zero, right? So there's no, uh, there, there are no other elements that can be both positive and negative. Right? And you, because of this, we can define a partial order on the self-adjoint elements in the sort of way you would expect. So you say A is below B, if when you look at B minus A, this is some positive element. Right? If, if, the, uh, if you just had a convex cone without properness, so without this condition here, uh, then you wouldn't actually necessarily have a partial order. You'd only have a pre-order, right? The key thing being that this properness here ensures that your relation here satisfies anti-symmetry. Right. The, the other conditions for a partial order, which I think Karen went through last time, were transitivity, which is really following from the fact that, that this is closed under sums, and, um, and also reflexivity. And that follows from the, the fact that zero is within this thing. But for the converse inclusion, that's, that's really what gives you anti-symmetry. So it's really a partial order on the collection of all self-adjoint elements. You could, incidentally, really define the partial order here on arbitrary elements if you wanted to. Right, but with exactly the same definition. And it would still give you a, a perfectly valid partial order. It's just, it turns out in most of the C charge of theory, you really only care about this order just on the self-adjoint elements. So what about, what about products? Well, one key thing to note, sort of the first, uh, well, the, the, the mistake that everybody when they're first learning about uh, C charge of makes is to assume that, that a product of positive elements is positive, right? Because, well, it's true on the real line, right? And it's sort of very tempting to think it's also true for C star algebras in general. But unfortunately, this is not the case. So a very simple example would be to take these two matrices. So the very first, so, so you're looking at two by two complex matrices here, which is the, the most basic example uh, of a, of a non-commutative C star algebra. And uh, with the usual matrix multiplication and addition, et cetera. So look at these two matrices. The first one just has one in the top left corner. So it's a nice, nice projection as it turns out. And the other ones just has, uh, has ones everywhere, which is actually also just a scalar multiple of a projection. And so you can very easily check 
that these these are self-adjoint, right? When you're looking at when you're looking at matrices, the star here is really just the transpose, really the conjugate transpose, right? So but these are all real real entries in this matrix. So in this case, the star is really just the transpose of the matrix. And both of these matrices you can immediately see are equal to their transpose. So they're self-adjoint, very nice. And uh, the first one, well, it's it's equal to its square. So it's not just self-adjoint, it's actually also positive. And the second one is not quite equal to its square. It's equal to a scalar multiple of its square. But that's enough to tell you that still, that's going to be not just self-adjoint, but positive element. Right? However, if you look at their products now, elementary calculation shows that this is the matrix you get, which is definitely not equal to its transpose. So here, the product of two positive elements is not even self-adjoint. So it's definitely not positive. Right? So that's just something to be aware of. However, there is a one special situation where you can say that the product of positive elements is positive. And that's if those two positive elements happen to commute. So in a sense, this is why why it does work uh, you know when you look at positive reals because positive reals you know the multiplication does indeed commute right? and so as long as you have this extra condition that the positive elements commute then yes indeed they will be positive and the proof is pretty simple it goes back to this this girl found representation theorem so uh, remember all commutative c star algebras are just continuous functions on uh, vanishing infinity on some locally compact space you know, complex valued function Right. And so if these two, these two elements A and B here commute, well, that means the C-star algebra they generate is again a commutative C-star algebra. So you can view, if you like, both A and B as functions on some space. Right. The fact that they're positive tells you that they're, they're functions with, which always have positive values. And as you're multiplying things point-wise when you're dealing with functions, of course, the, the resulting function, again, will always only take positive values. Okay. Uh, and another sort of way of saying this really is to say that whenever you have a, a product of positive elements, which is also self-adjoint, then in fact, it has to be positive. The reason being there's this sort of you know, little trick that, that if, you, if you have a product which is self-adjoint, really what that's saying is that A and B commute, right? Because remember the star here, this operation always reverses the product. So A, B star is B star A. So if you're dealing with positive, and in particular self-adjoint elements, A and B, well, this is really just saying that A, B and B, A are the same. So, so from that, the fact that it's self-adjoint says they commute, which says that, okay, the product is again positive. Uh, I guess that's, yeah, I guess that's really only one direction. That's, just, that's saying that the, the right-hand side is included in the left-hand side. But conversely, we remember that every positive element has some unique, as it turns out, square root. So in particular, every element is itself a product, every positive element is a product of other positive elements. You know, the same, in fact, as the square root. So these two things are exactly the same. And the reason I mentioned this is because this, this helps you sort of improve this, this property of being a proper cone. Right? So instead of just saying that positive the intersection of the positive part and the negative part of your C-star algebra is zero, you can actually say that even a product of positives, if that also happens to be negative, well, the only possibility is that it's actually zero. Right? Because let's say you did have something in this intersection. Well, if it's, if it's a negative element, then in particular, it is self-adjoint. So I can just add an intersection of, of ASA here without you know, affecting the, the whole intersection. But what we just showed, remember, was that this intersection here, this, this first part here, uh, turns out to just be A plus. So this brings you back to the original condition that Karen proved last time that it's a, a proper cone. Okay, and uh, another key fact to recall, again, I think Karen did this last time, is that, that if, you, if you have any arbitrary element now in your C star algebra and you multiply a positive element on either side, on one side by A, on the other side by A star, could be vice versa, then again, you'll always end up with some positive element. So the, the positive elements are closed under, well, I guess what, conjugate product or something like this, right? So it's something how, how you might say it. Uh, and well, yeah, I can even give you a very simple proof straight away, it's, it's quite easy. So you say, well, let's look at A, B, A star, where B is already known to be positive. Thanks to that, we know it has a positive square root. 
So, so just immediately you see that this product here, where you look at a square root b and the star of a square root b, well, remember the star reverses the product. So this b square root will go in the middle and then b square root b square root will become b. So that will turn it into a b a star. So that tells you that, and remember that a plus anything in the form, you know, c c star is positive. So in this case, a square root b, a square root b star, this is positive. Okay, easy. So, uh, and another observation I just want to point out for the next slide is that, that if you want to work out if some element is zero, then one often convenient way to test this is to look at its, as the product with its star. Right? If a, a star is zero, or indeed a star a is zero, the order doesn't matter here, then that automatically implies that a is zero. Sometimes this is referred to being as a, a, a condition of, of being a proper star ring. And in this case, it's it, this follows just from the C star norm uh, quality, right? Remember this key property of um, C star algebras as opposed to arbitrary Banach algebras, Banach star algebras even, is that the, the norm of A star A is the same as the norm of A squared. So if A, a star is zero, that means the norm of that is zero, which means the norm of A is zero, which means that A is zero, right? Okay. <clears throat> And putting these facts together, we see that if you have some positive element B and you know that A, B, A star is zero, well, in fact, that already implies that A and B are zero. So A and the, the product of A and B is zero, right? Because you just rewrite this A, B, A star again, using this, this trick of like writing it as something, something star, we're using the square root of B, okay? And if that's zero, well, okay, A square root B is zero. But once you've got that, and then you just multiply again on both sides by the square root of b, and you've shown that a, b is zero. And the reason I'm telling you all these sort of little, uh, little facts is that it's, it's gonna help us prove this next result, which you may remember from last time. So there was this key thing that Karen mentioned about how every self-adjoint element has a unique decomposition into you know, a difference of two positive elements, then it's unique with respect to this condition that, that they're orthogonal, that their product is zero. Now, without that condition, there could indeed be many different uh, positive elements which would satisfy this, but these are the unique ones that are orthogonal in this sense. Okay, so what Karen showed last time is that there, uh, th this exists, but basically there's a, a nice sort of continuous functional calculus argument to say, that they exist. I mean, if uh, maybe I can even try and uh, sort of very roughly draw what was going on last time. So let's see if I can draw on this. So, so imagine you have some, I know you have some function, right? So I know, coming up and down, something like this, right? And maybe I should also make it go back to zero like that. So that's some continuous function, right? Like real values. So it's a self adjoint element in the, the C star algebra of all continuous functions on this, this space, which is meant to re represent by this line. And so the, the positive part, you just you just look at the, uh, so can I change colors here? So you just look at this part here, right? That, that would be your positive part. And, and then you would set it to be zero here. And then again like that. Uh, and likewise, uh, for the negative part, you would you'd just look at the bottom, right? And then you would take the negative to ensure that this is actually a positive element, right? So that's sort of roughly the, the image you should have in your, your mind. Uh, so we know they exist, right? Um, and the only question is uniqueness. And, and Karen left this as an exercise, but actually it's, uh, and, and often people do kind of gloss over this fact that it's, it's unique, but it's actually a little bit, little bit trickier to prove than, than you might expect. So it would be a bit of a, a tough exercise, I think. So I just wanted to see, show you at least one way of, of how you could actually prove this. But let's say we do have some other elements. Let's call them B plus and B minus. So again, these are positive elements, uh, which are again, orthogonal, and which again, give you some decomposition. So you can express A as the difference of B plus and B minus. Well, let's do a little, little calculation. So let's, let's look at this product here. So Let's look at a plus minus b plus squared times a minus. So a plus minus b plus, that's some self-adjoint element, right? 
And if I take the square of a self-adjoint element, that gives me something positive. And a minus is also, also positive, right, by assumption. So this is a product of two positive elements. Okay, but then we do a few little calculations and we find that, well, if you look at a minus times this a plus minus b minus, well, a minus is supposed to be orthogonal to a plus, right? So that, that part actually just cancels out. So all you're left with, in fact, is the, for the, for the first, for, you know, one of these, these uh, differences here, at least, you're, you're left with minus b plus times a minus. Okay, so this is what this says here, right? So I've, I've deleted one of the a plus minus b plus expressions and just replaced it with minus b plus. Uh, and then you just do the same thing, but here you say, ah, but, but I can't, I don't want to work with A plus minus B plus. Let's work instead with A minus, minus B minus. And I can do that because remember, I'm assuming that, that A is, can be decomposed like this, B plus minus B minus. And A can also be decomposed as A plus minus A minus. So just do a bit of elementary manipulation, you know, take the, uh, I guess, what, so let's say that is equal to that. So take the B minus on one side and take the A minus on the other side. And you'll see that these two expressions are exactly the same. And because we're assuming that B plus is orthogonal to B minus, we can again just cancel that part out, right? So that all we're left really with now is this A minus times B plus times A minus with a, a minus out the front here, right? Anyway, that tells us sort of, something interesting, right? Because this, remember A minus, you know, if you take some positive element, in this case A minus, times again, uh, a positive element, but you, you do the positive elements on either side, well, that gives you, again, a positive element. So with this negative thing out the front, I've shown that on the one hand, this is the product of two positive elements. On the other hand, it should be a negative element. But remember, we just showed like a, a slide or two ago that there is only one element which satisfies those conditions and that's zero. Right? So this tells you that A minus B plus A minus is equal to zero. And again, on the previous side, we, we showed that this kind of expression being zero actually is really just saying that the first part, the A minus times B plus is zero, right? Okay, so, so that's sort of part, part of the work done. Now we look at, Another expression. Let's look at the product of A plus and B plus. Well, again, knowing that with this, this newfound knowledge that A minus and B plus are really just the product is zero there, but well, we can replace the A plus with this, this whole expression here, A plus minus A minus, which by assumption is just A, right? Okay, which again, by assumption is the same thing as B plus minus B minus. And thanks to these two guys being orthogonal, B minus B plus, we can again just delete that and we're left with B plus squared. Okay, so where's, where's all this going? You might wonder, well, now think about what you've done and think and just notice that you could, do, could have done exactly the same kind of argument, except instead of using A's, you use B's. And instead of using B's, you use A's. So swap the A's and the B's, right? Exactly the same kind of uh, argument would hold. And what you would end up with then is that instead of B plus squared is equal to A plus B, you'd end up with A plus squared is equal to B plus A. Right? But again, this, this fact that this, this product here is self-adjoint tells you that that in fact, they commute. Right? So, so actually what we end up with is that A plus squared is equal to B plus squared. And now we're finally getting somewhere because remember that positive square roots are unique. So we're using the uniqueness of positive square roots here to, to get this other uniqueness result. And now we're basically done. Now, finally, we've managed to prove that A plus is exactly the same as B plus. And once you know that, well, then you just subtract the, the A plus and the B plus from both sides. And you've also shown that B minus is equal to A minus. So the un uniqueness here is, is, I think, a little bit more subtle than, than, uh, yeah, than a lot of people sometimes realize. There's, a, there's another, if you're interested, there's another different argument for showing uniqueness here in this book by uh, Catterson and Ringrose, uh, a sort of classic text on C-star algebra theory. Okay, so next. Uh, yep, any, any questions so far or it's all good? Okay, I'll take that as a no. 
So next thing, uh, let's go back to this order structure. So remember the positive ele elements allow us to define an order structure on the self adjoints. Our A is below B, B minus A is a positive element. And again, thanks to this fact that, you know, a sort of conjugate product of some positive element is again positive. Well, this passes immediately to this order structure. So if A is below B, then C star A for any C, right? It doesn't have to be self adjoint positive or anything like that. Any C, excuse me, C star A is going to be below C star B, which is an often useful fact. Uh, again, going back to last lecture, I think Karen proved that uh, whenever you have two self adjoints which are invertible, then as you would expect, taking inverses reverses the order. I think it was, yeah, was it self adjoint? Um, yeah, I think it was self adjoint. Yeah, it wasn't. Uh, Maybe, maybe it was only positive here, actually, now that I'm thinking about it. Yeah. Okay, it's definitely true for positive. Whether it's true for self adjoint, uh, not 100% sure. Um, and another little fact, which I'm not sure was mentioned last time, but, but it's fairly easy to see, is that if you have two positive elements and you know that one is below the other, well, then that immediately tells you that the norm uh, is also, uh, norm of the first one is also below the norm of the second. Right? So if this is, uh, if these guys commute, well, then this immediately follows from the, the Gelfand representation. So, so again, if you're imagining A and B as functions on some space, the same space, well, then for A to be below B means that at every point, A, the, the positive value of A is still below the positive value of B. So if you take the supremum over all those values, then of course, the supremum uh, over all values for A is gonna be less than the supremum for all values for B. And this is just the norm. Right? So if they commute, immediate from Gelfand representation. But using that, it's actually true even in general, even when A and B do not commute. And the little trick here, I guess, is just to note that, that B is always below uh, the norm of B times one. So the one here is just the, the, the unit of your C-star algebra, so which is just the function which takes the value one everywhere. So assuming you have a unit. If you don't have a unit, well, you just unitize and everything is fine. So, so the fact that B is below this means that if A is below B, and we know that this is indeed a, a partial order, right? That if A is below B, which is itself below the norm of B times one, well, that tells you that A is below the norm of B times one as well. And these guys we know commute. Even if A and B don't commute, A is always going to commute with any scalar multiple of one. So thanks to that, then that tells you that, okay, the norm of A is less than the norm of this guy, but the norm of a scalar multiple of one is simply that multiple, right? In this case, is just the norm of B. So a simple fact, but often, often quite uh, a quite useful observation. And now let's let's talk about unit balls. So there's there's really two unit balls of interest. There's the what you might call a positive open unit ball. It's not actually it's not actually open in the norm topology, but, but open in the sense that you look at that all those elements, all those positive elements, which have norms strictly less than one. And this is, this is one thing. And then you can look at their closure, which is of course, all those positive elements, which have norm at most one, but possibly equal to one. Or if you want to put it another way, it's really all those self adjoint elements, which in this ordering lie strictly between, or well, lie between zero and one, not necessarily strictly. Could be zero, could be one, but they lie in between. Uh, zero and one. So these these play a prominent role, and the uh, well, the key thing to note is that that the open unit ball is is directed, and in fact, we can actually prove something a bit stronger using a a kind of surprisingly recent result of of Lawrence G. Brown. So uh, yeah, even though C to algebra theory has been around for you know a long time since well, definitely since the nineteen forties, that's when things were going. There are still some you know interesting foundational results, which are still being, being proved now. So, and this is one of them. So what this says is that if you have one element in the closed unit ball and another in the open positive unit ball, then we can find yet another one which dominates them, which again lies this time within the, the uh, closed uh, positive unit ball, right? So it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of fine, uh, you know, uh, I know, subtle su hypothesis, I guess, in a sense. If, if B here was, was lying just within the closed positive unit ball, 
then this would no longer be true. You would not always be able to find such a C. Sometimes, depending on your C-star algebras, like I think for compact operators, yes, but, uh, but not in general. Okay, so it's, it's sort of subtle. One can be in the closure, but the other one has to lie strictly, has to have norms strictly less than one. And the argument is a kind of cute little continuous functional calculus argument, if you like. So to find this C, you look at this, this corresponding expression. And uh, yeah, it looks a bit sort of arbitrary and I don't know how on earth Brown came up with this, but it, it does the job. So you look at B plus, plus D times this guy here, uh, again with D on the other side, where D is the square root of one minus B. So, so B remember has norms strictly less than one and it's self-adjoint. So one minus B is also self-adjoint and positive, right? If B had norm greater than one, this wouldn't be positive. You wouldn't be able to take square roots, but because, because it is positive, we know we can take a positive square root, which is very nice. And not only that, because the norm is strictly less than one, it's not just positive, but it's also invertible, right? Both this expression and the square root is invertible. And uh, I mean, again, this really goes back to the Gelfand representation, because if you were looking at the function B and, and that B was, was you know, bounded from above strictly by one, and as soon as you take the minus, you see that your function is always gonna be positive. It's gonna be strictly above zero. Right for all uh, elements in your your space that your function is taking values on, right? Uh, and, and once you do that, well, then you can just take inverses pointwise, right? And that will give you the the inverse in the C star algebra. Well, in the C star algebra it generates, I guess, but then of course in the whole C star algebra as well. So that means we do indeed have an inverse. So we can indeed write D inverse here. Right? So you're taking D inverse times A minus B, and you look this positive here. This is the this is indeed the positive part of this element. Exactly in the sense that we were describing before, where you take any self-adjoint element and split it up into its positive and negative parts. So you're looking at just the positive part here. So what we have to do is uh, show that this C really does the job, that it's, at, that it's above A and B, and that really also lies within the closed positive unit ball. Well, it's immediate, in fact, that it's above B, right? Why? Because, well, this, this is a positive element, right? I mean, this, this whole expression is by definition the positive part of this, this whole element and multiplying on either side by, by D, right? Which is again, positive, doesn't change the fact that it's, it's a positive element. So if you're adding a positive element, well, the definition of the order structure tells you you're gonna get something bigger. So certainly B is less than or equal to C. That's, that's basically by definition. But further note that any, any element, any self adjoint element is definitely below its positive part. Right. Again, just think of the functions and think of how you're just taking the positive part. Well, that's certainly going to be above the whole function that you started with. So it's going to be below its positive part. So, well, then let's, let's look at A. Well, A is certainly the same as B plus A minus B. And this is certainly the same as B plus one, or in this case written as D times D minus one, uh, times A minus B times D inverse D. And because this middle part here is below its positive part, well, again, that extends to, to the expression you get by multiplying by D on either side, right? And again, that extends to the expression you get by just adding B on either side, okay? So, so we've finally got this expression here, which is exactly uh, how we defined C. So what we've shown is that C is also above A. Okay, so finally, we have to show that it's C here is not too big, that it still, still has norm, uh, that, that it's still positive, and that, that it uh, still has norm at most one. Okay, well, A has norm at most one. Okay, so that means that if I look at this expression, that again, uh, the fact that A is less than one means that A minus B is less than one minus B. And again, I can multiply by D inverse this time on either side, and the inequality remains valid. Okay, but, but look at this one minus B. This is really just D squared, right? This is how we defined D at the very beginning. It was just the square root of one minus D. So this is D squared. And of course, D squared times two inverses of D just gets you back to one. Okay, so this, this thing here is below one, which tells you that, uh, let's see. Uh, okay, so D, so when you take the, the positive part of that, well, it's still, 
it's still below one, right? Uh, and so if you multiply by D on either side, well, multiplying one by D on either side just gives you D squared, which again is just one minus B, which is definitely below one, right? So C is definitely below one. And it's, well, it's positive. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's definitely positive, right? You can see that from the very beginning. This is a positive element here, uh, multiplied by the side, it's still positive, adding some positive elements, still positive, right? So it's all positive. But the key thing is that it's also uh, norm at most one. It's less than or equal to one. Okay, so that's, uh, that's um, a nice, quite, uh, quite strong result. But the main reason actually you want to know about this is because it tells you in particular that the open unit ball is directed. So remember a directed set, you can talk about directed sets for any partial order. It simply means that given two elements in your partial order, you can always find a common upper bound. So I'm always talking about upwards directed sets here. Okay, and this, uh, this fact that the positive open unit ball is directed, well, this is a much more classic result. So I think if I'm not mistaken, this goes back to Dixmere in the 60s. So he, you know, he proved this in a slightly different way, but using this, this nice result of Brown, we can get it very quickly. So we just look at our two positive elements uh, in, the, in the open unit ball now, uh, then we can always, always make them a, a tiny bit bigger. You know, we just take any R bigger than one, which is still small enough, right? And, and again, this will still lie within the positive unit ball. And then thanks to Brown's result, we know that we have some C in the closed positive unit ball, which dominates them. But it's fairly easy to see that, you know, the, I, mean, I guess I didn't mention this explicitly, but if A is uh, below B, then this, the same is true if you multiply both sides by any, uh, non, any, any positive scale, right? I mean, this follows from the fact that the, the positive elements themselves are closed under multiplication by positive scalars. Okay, so if this is true, then I can multiply both sides by R inverse. And because R is strictly less than one, R inverse is strictly, sorry, R is greater than one strictly. R inverse is strictly less than one. And so that means that while C was in the closed positive unit ball, this slightly smaller multiple here has to be within the open unit ball. So that's the, that gives you the result you want. That AB is indeed dominated by something in the open positive unit ball. Okay, that's, uh, so that's that. <clears throat> I also wanted to introduce at this stage another kind of order relation. It's not exactly a partial order relation because it's not reflexive, and, uh, but uh, I guess it will be anti-symmetric. But the key thing is it, it is it is a transitive relation. And this is maybe not quite as well known. I mean, I think uh, if you look at Blackadder's kind of encyclopedia on, on Caesar Adams, he does, he introduces this, this nice uh, relation here. But But I think a lot of, a lot of results actually can be phrased uh, uh, more succinctly or more naturally in terms of this relation, or in fact, in terms of a kind of approximation to this relation that we will introduce very shortly. So domination, I'll call it, is, is defined as solid follows. So again, you could define it, I guess, for arbitrary elements, but we're primarily interested in elements in the, the positive closed you know, ball. So we say A is dominated by B, if A is equal to AB, right? Very, very simple. And one immediate observation to make is that whenever A is dominated by B, and these guys are a self adjoint positive elements, remember, that in fact, uh, A and B have to commute, right? Because if AB is equal to A, well then, and A is itself self adjoint well, that means this is equal to AB star. And again, recalling that stars flip the order of multiplication, this gives you B of A. Okay, so if they, and once you know that, well, once you know they're commutable, then you immediately see that being dominated by A is in fact a sort of strong version of being, uh, of, the, of the order relation we already have. So again, maybe it's, uh, maybe it's helpful if I, you know, maybe try and draw a little picture. So, so remember, so imagine you have, you have some space here and you have some, some function, let's say like this, right? And let's say that it sort of plateaus out and it's one down there, right? So this is, okay, let's maybe draw a line here and this is 
So this is this plateau here lies at at one. Okay. So that's going to be your your b, your function b on this space. And now consider a. So for a to be dominated by b in terms of this function, maybe you can you can already see what it, what it's really saying. It's really saying that a has to lie completely within the sort of part of part where B gets B maps that part to one, right? It has to, the support of A has to lie completely within here for this expression A, B, A, A equals A, B to hold, right? right? If it had any little bits out here, then at this point here, you'd see that this times, you know, whatever A is here will be strictly smaller than, than the, the actual value of A because this is strictly smaller than one. Right? So in particular, you know, and if this is, as long as this is itself of norm at most one, in particular, each point here of, of the values of A has to be below the, the values of B, right? Uh, it's, it's certainly possible that, you know, you could have some other thing, which is point-wise below B, like this, right? Uh, but is not dominated by B, right? So this is, sure, this, I don't know, what would you call, call it? C, I see, I guess. So the C here, is point-wise below B, but indeed it contains parts outside where B takes non one values. And so this is not actually gonna be dominated by B. Domination is a, is a strictly stronger relation on these, uh, on the positive closed unit ball. So, that, uh, so hopefully that's, that's clear. Okay. So what next? I mean, what we'd really like to show here, sort of in a, in a dream fantasy world, is that this positive closed unit ball is not just, uh, is not, well, the open unit ball is not just directed with respect to the classical order. You'd really like to show that it's, it's actually directed with respect to this much stronger domination relation. Uh, the only problem is that this, this is indeed a fantasy. It's, it's not actually true for many basic examples. However, in general, it is still, approximately true in a sense that I can I can make precise as follows. So uh, let me see. see if I can clear all this crap I've done there. Okay. So approximate domination. So this is a yeah perhaps a slightly non-standard way of, of looking at things but but like I said I think looking at approximate domination helps to kind of clarify a lot of arguments that, that are classically done. Okay, so we say that A is dominated by B modulo epsilon, if you like, for some, some positive number epsilon, if the norm of A minus AB is less than or equal to epsilon. So the, so the, the bigger epsilon is, the, the kind of looser this relation is. And, uh, and indeed, if epsilon is actually equal to zero, well, then you see that this, this is saying the norm is equal to zero, which is really just saying A is equal to AB. Right, so so zero is indeed precisely the relation you started with this domination relation. So for small for small values of epsilon, you can kind of imagine this as saying that uh, a is almost dominated by b. That's the the intuition behind this. And uh, an elementary but important result is that even though when you when you have an element in your let's say closed positive unit ball, you don't always have an element that can dominate a on the nodes. Right. If you think about, if you think about again about functions, if you look at functions on say some non-compact space, right? So let's sort of look at functions on the real line. Let's say, right? This is a non-compact space, and if you're you're looking at the functions which vanish at infinity, well, you could have something that is vanishing at infinity but still non-zero everywhere. So something like I don't know one over one plus x squared or something, right? So you'd get this kind of bell curve, it's still non-zero everywhere. And there you would see that there is, there is never going to be something which dominates it. Because to dominate it, it would have to be one everywhere. And that would mean it doesn't vanish at infinity. So it's not within the c star algebra, you know, the, or functions vanishing infinity on the real line. So you can't always get something that, that dominates some arbitrary element here. However, you can get something which almost dominates it for some arbitrarily small error, epsilon. And the proof is, again, uh, again, using this continuous functional calculus by Galfand. So just remember that uh, 
given our A here, the positive unit ball, self adjoint. So in particular, we can we can basically identify A with uh, with a or well, we can identify the C star algebra generated by A with the complex valued functions on the spectrum of A. And the spectrum of A is just some just some subset of of the real line in this case because it's self adjoint. And in fact, it's a some subset of the unit interval because we know A has norm at most one and it's positive. And so we can identify this C-star algebra with C-star algebra of functions. And under this identification, A uh, is, is the same as the identity map on this spectrum. Okay. Now take some continuous function on the spectrum, uh, which satisfies the following you know, non, uh, you know, simple conditions. So we want it to be zero at zero. We want it to be uh, strictly less than one, as long as uh, zero, well, yeah, I guess it, I guess it doesn't have to be, does it have to be strictly less? I want it to be, I want it to be definitely, yeah, I want it to be strictly less than one whenever zero is between, X is between zero and epsilon. But the key thing is that I really want it to be very close to one, let's say one minus epsilon for most of the unit interval, most of the spectrum at least, uh, which is contained within unit interval. So whenever X is between epsilon and one, and if epsilon is small, this is like most of your interval, well, then I want f of x to be very close to one. And you can sort of, you can sort of, again, you know, think to yourself that that's, that's always going to be possible. So maybe I should, uh, again, draw a nice little picture. So, so if you look at, so say we have, we're looking at the unit interval. So this is zero and this is, this is one, right? Okay, so you're identifying a here with just the identity map, right? Okay, so, so that's A. And all I'm saying is, well, let's look at a function which starts here and it goes up to almost almost to one fairly, fairly quickly, right? So this would be, this would be epsilon here. Mm. It's a very badly written epsilon, but I hope you get the idea. And then I want it to be to sort of hang, hang very close to one for the rest of, unit interval right okay so you can see that that it kind of i guess you can already see that it really does almost dominate this right this most of this original identity here which corresponds to to a right does indeed lie in, in the sort of part of this new function which is almost one right this area here okay and if you i mean but yeah the key thing is that of my ability to change slides. Hang on, let me get rid of this. Okay. And so the, the key thing to note here is that once you do this and you look at this, this new function you get, so X here is sort of representing the identity function here. But so if you look at X minus X times FX, well, it's always going to be less than epsilon, right? Right, for small values of x, this has to be less than or equal to x. For large values of x, it has to be less than f of x, which in this case is going to be less than or equal to, uh, sorry, it has to be less than or equal to uh, one minus f of x, right? And because you chose f of x to be very close to one, well, that means it also has to still be very uh, below epsilon on all those values. So, so this holds with this new function for all values in your spectrum. Well, hang on, I can see something in the chat. Oh, okay. It's in the link of the lectures. Yes. Uh, yes, I'll uh, I'll send uh, I'll put some link or whatever to the, to the lecture notes somewhere. Okay, so what does that tell you? Well, if you now look at this function a minus a f of a, and I'm using some notation here, which is quite convenient and which which is sort of fairly standard and hopefully you can kind of get used to. When you write f of a for some continuous f, what you're really doing is you're really talking about the image under this, this, uh, this embedding i here or iota of the function f, right? But instead of writing iota of f, it's more standard uh, where I, iota is determined by a, it's really more standard to just write f of a. I mean, the, the, the idea being that if, if f is some kind of polynomial, like, I don't know, x cubed minus x or something, then indeed you could rewrite this simply f of a as a cubed minus a, right? So you're extending the, the usual 
notation for polynomials just to more general continuous functions. Okay, so if you look at this, this uh, particular element here, which if we're gonna be really precise, there's really the, the image under the embedding iota determined by A of this function here, identity minus identity uh, times F, uh, well, that is going to be less than or equal to epsilon. But what does that tell you? Well, this is by definition here, this approximate domination. What this is really saying is that A is approximately dominated by F of A. So approximate in this sense, meaning modulo epsilon. And because we chose F to always have values between zero and strictly less than one, we know that F of A lies within the open uh, positive unit ball. Okay, so that's one little thing. So we know, if you like, this is, this is already part way to what we wanted to do. So remember what we were really trying to do is show that every pair of elements in the closed positive unit ball is dominated or at least approximately dominated by some single element. And this is sort of the first step. Instead of a pair of elements, you have at least got, you know, given one element, well, at least given one element, I can almost dominate that by some other element. Whether we can do that with two elements remains to be seen. So let's, let's continue. So the first, next thing we want to note is that this approximate version of domination is in a sense auxiliary to the, the usual order relation defined by the positive element. So it's sort of a, yeah, I guess, transitivity, but with two relations instead of one. So the result says that if A is below B, just in the usual order theoretic sense, and B is almost dominated by C, then it turns out that this kind of transitivity holds and A is almost dominated by C. The, the exact quant quantification of what almost means does change a little bit. So while B might be dominated by C modulo epsilon. In the end, you will only know that A is almost dominated modulo square root of epsilon you know, uh, by C. Right? So, so there is a, the, the, the subscript here could get larger. However, it will never get too much larger. So this turns out to be not such a, an important issue. Okay, so the first thing to note is that if you're taking these A's, B's and C's within the positive, closed positive unit ball, well then uh, A squared is below A, right? And again, this just goes back to Galvin, right? Think about functions. Think about a, a function on some space which takes values only between zero and one. Right? For anything in between zero and one, the square is always gonna be below the number you started. Once you go above one, of course, this fails, right? Two, you know, two squared is definitely bigger than two, but a half squared is less than a half. So we know that a squared is below a, and that helps us because if we look at the norm of this expression here, a minus a c, well, just rewriting this as a times one minus c. So again, I guess I'm being a bit loose here because I'm, I'm not assuming my algebra is unital, right? But, uh, but you can always unitize, or you can also just view this as a kind of shorthand, right? As a times one minus c is really shorthand for a minus a c. And that doesn't require a unit, that definitely is valid within the C star algebra A. And remember, remember the, this again, classic C star norm equality that says the norm of something squared is the same as that, as the norm of that something star times that something. Right? And stars switch the order of multiplication. So really what you end up with is this thing star, which is now one, one minus C times A, right? There would be some stars here, except that we know that C and A individually are positive and hence self -adjoint. So we don't need to worry about those. So it switches the order. You've got one minus C times A times the original uh, A one minus C that you started with. Okay, and now, now remember A, A squared is less than or equal to A. This was this observation just above. And remember again, that if, if you, ha you have this property that if something is below something else, you can multiply on both sides by the same positive elements and the inequality remains up. So this, this whole expression here is below this whole expression here in the usual, whoops, in the usual ordering. And again, use this property, the fact that if, if you have two positive elements, one is below the other, well then the norm is also uh, satisfy exactly the same inequality. So finally, with all those little observations put together, this is saying the norm of this whole thing here 
has to be below the norm of this whole thing here. Okay, now finally we can use the fact that A is below B, right? And exactly the same kind of argument as before, right? So A squared is below A, that's what allowed us to get this. Likewise, A being below B, all applying on either side, just taking norms, the inequality still remains up. Okay, and now we're, now we're getting closer to what we want because sub-multiplicativity allows us to, to separate this one minus C at the front here, right? And because C is in the positive unit ball, the norm here here has to be at most one. So we can again just delete it without affecting the inequality. So finally, this is this is below B times one minus C. All right, but but that remember is just B minus BC. So the norm of that has to be less than epsilon because we're assuming that B is almost modulo epsilon dominated by C. So going back to the very beginning, this was the norm of this expression squared. So if that's below epsilon, well, that means the norm of the original expression has to be below the square root of epsilon. In other words, e is almost sorry, a is almost dominated by c modulo the square root of epsilon. Now. And in particular, remember we can take epsilon equal to zero, right? And that will give us the original uh, domination relation that, that Blackadder Blackadder introduced in his book. So so what, in this case, it's really just showing that, that this relation is, is what's sometimes called right auxiliary to the order relation that you started with. Right? A below B dominated by C means A is also dominated by C. Okay. Now we're, we're going to try and prove this approximate directed result, result that we really wanted to get to. And first, I just wanted to make a little, little observation that almost domination behaves as you would sort of expect or hope with respect to scalar multiples, at least, at least scalar multiples, which are less than one. I mean, it would, I guess, apply to even greater scalar multiples, except we, we, we were specifying at the start that we really only care about domination or approximate domination when you're in the, the closed positive unit ball. Okay, so if you multiply, so if you have an expression and you know that R of A is dominated by B modulo psi epsilon, well, then it actually also follows just by this chain of, of uh, equivalences, just definitions, uh, that in fact, A is also itself almost dominated by B, just with a, a slightly different, you know, uh, approximation with instead of R, instead of epsilon now, you have R inverse epsilon. <clears throat> so the proposition now is that even though the closed positive unit ball is not necessarily uh, directed with respect to domination, it is directed with respect to almost domination with, with, with an arbitrarily small error here. And we put together a few of our results and our observations to, to get this result. So first, uh, take, take two elements in your closed positive unit ball. And note that this remains valid when we multiply by some, some scalar multiple in between zero and one. I don't think it really matters what you pick as long as it's strictly between zero and say R is equal to a half if you, if you prefer. So thanks to this result of Dixmere about the, the open positive unit ball being directed with the usual order, we can find some single upper bound of both RA and RB. But also we know that each single element C in this case is going to be dominated, almost dominated by some other element, D, let's say, in again the closed positive unit ball. And the, the almost here can be arbitrarily small, as small as I like. So, so if I'm assuming my epsilon greater than zero is fixed here, uh, then, then for any other R greater than zero, I can look at R squared, epsilon squared. It might be smaller, but it's still positive, right? So uh, as long as that's true, then I can find this D. Yeah. Okay. And so uh, remember this auxiliarity property we had. So if, if RA is below C, which is almost dominated by D, well, that means RA is itself almost dominated by C with a, a slightly bigger you know, error, right? The square root, uh, which in this case is just R epsilon. And exactly the same thing applies to RB. 
And now using this observation we have just above here, uh, then you can actually multiply by the, both the error and the left side by our inverse. And that tells you that A and B are dominated by C, modulo epsilon. So that finally gets you the result. We can indeed prove directedness with respect to approximate domination. Uh, another thing to note is that you have, okay, you have what you might call approximate transitivity. So you can show that domination is definitely a transitive relation, but you can prove something stronger. You can show that even, even approximation is, is uh, approximate domination is transitive as long as you add up the two errors. Okay, which is just here. If A is almost dominated by B, is almost dominated by C, then A is almost dominated by C, where, where there is at summing the, the errors. Uh, and again, it's a fairly simple calculation. So you want to look at you want to look at this norm of A1 minus C. The goal is to show it's below epsilon plus delta. Well, let's just note that I could rewrite this expression uh, by sticking one in the middle. If I can stick one in the middle, well, then I can stick one minus B plus B in the middle. No big deal. And the subadditivity of the norm tells me that I can now separate the, the one minus B part from the B part. So I get these two separate expressions here. Could possibly have increased the norm, but that's fine. Okay, now I apply sub multiplicativity. Um, and again I, again, I guess I should mention the, the ones here, you know, the one may not be within the uh, algebra, but we're, but we're just calculating norms here. So there's no problem in, in calculating the norm in, in this sort of larger, unitization if we have to. Okay, so you look at sub multiplicativity, this gives us this, but because we're only concerned with elements in the closed positive unit ball, C, you know, C lies between zero and one. So one minus C also lies between zero and one. And, and likewise, A we know uh, from the outset lies between zero and one. So we can just delete these, these little extra bits, uh, again, possibly increasing the norm, but that's fine. So this finally gets us to, to this point here, which by assumption, the fact that A is almost dominated by B, B is almost dominated by C, tells us that, uh, that, that, that these A is almost dominated by C, modulo uh, these two errors, these individual errors. Yeah. Okay, and our little corollary is that we have an actual transitive relation if we're willing to expand our closed positive unit ball a little. So instead of just looking at this, we look at pairs now, consisting of, of an element in the ball and some elements strictly between zero and one. So on this, this product here, this Cartesian product, we define a new uh, transitive relation, which is that saying that A is almost dominated by B where the error is epsilon minus delta. And why is that, why is that transitive? Well, it follows immediately from approximate transitivity above. So if, if we have these expressions, if A epsilon is below B delta is below C gamma, well, then what that really means by definition is this. But then if you add epsilon minus delta and delta minus gamma, well, then you're going to get epsilon minus gamma, which tells you exactly that this is below that. So we have a, a non to god transitive relation now on these, these pairs. And that immediately gets us uh, an approximate unit. What is an approximate unit? Well, first, I hope you're familiar with nets from general topology. So a net, remember, is just some family of elements of some usually topological space, which is indexed by some directed set. So the set could be uh, the natural numbers, for example, with their usual ordering. That's a, definitely a directed set. And so in that case, a net would just be a sequence in the usual sense. But the idea with nets is that they can be, they can be uncountable and they can allow you to do you know, topology even with non-separable spaces. So an approximate unit is a special kind of net. It's a net that lies in a closed positive unit ball uh, and it's one which, which behaves somewhat like a unit. So if it was a unit, then, then you would immediately be able to say that A lambda times B is just B, right? So an approximate unit is something where this holds in the limit, if you like. The norm, the norm here of the difference between those two expressions approaches zero. And if you want to write that out in full, what that's really saying is that for every epsilon 
strictly greater than zero, I can find some element alpha in my indexing set such that beyond alpha, for all those lambda strictly greater than alpha, this norm here is always strictly less than epsilon. As long as I can do that for arbitrary epsilon, then, then we say the, the limit here is zero. Okay. So if we want to find an approximate unit for, uh, you know, for, the, for the whole algebra, right? So I want this to hold for, for all B in the entire algebra, right? But actually, I don't need to consider arbitrary B. I can actually, it actually suffices to consider just positive B. So the reason being that, so say I had proved this, that it's an approximate unit just for the positive elements. And then I take some arbitrary element B. Now let's look at this, this norm expression. I want to show that approaches zero. So let's look at the norm squared. As long as the norm squared approaches zero, I'm, I'm, I'm golden, right? So, but again, we use this C star norm equality, which says the norm squared here, if you write it out, is this times this star, right? So if you write it out like that, you'll find it's A lambda minus one, with BB star in the middle, and again, A lambda minus one on the right. Okay, but if the BB star, remember, is positive. So if this A lambda here is an approximate unit, right, uh, for positive elements, well, in particular, it's an approximate unit for BB star. Right. Okay. And uh, yeah, and I can immediately just lop off one of these guys because you know this this submultiplicativity and then uh, the fact that this has norm at most one means I can just forget about say the uh, the right hand a lambda minus one let's say. And because this is an approximate unit for BB star, well this is going to approach zero. And if something below something that approaches zero, well it again is going to approach zero. So really, I don't need to show something as approximate unit you know, for the whole thing. I really only have to show it for positive elements. And in fact, I don't even have to use arbitrary positive elements. Again, a very simple argument says that I can rescale my an, an arbitrary positive, positive element to ensure it lies within the, the open positive unit ball. And, uh, and then as long as it's an approximate unit for those guys, it has to be an approximate unit for arbitrary positive and hence arbitrary elements. Okay, and the key result here is that every C star algebra does indeed have an approximate unit. So even though algebras are not, the C star algebras are not always unital, uh, sometimes you can get away with just adjoining a unit to, to make your argument work. But sometimes for slightly, slightly more sophisticated things, you have to instead use an approximate unit. And that's fine because approximate units always exist. And this is a, an even older result, right? So going, going back in time in some sense. So of course, I'm not exactly sure how Segal originally proved this, but, uh, but I guess he, he didn't have access to Dixmere's result. So he would have had to do it in some other way. Dixmere also didn't have access to Brown's results. So of course he did it in a different way as well. So what's the approximate unit gonna be? Well, it's just gonna be uh, a very simple net. It's just gonna be a, a collection of elements indexed by these pairs, remember, with this ordering we just defined on the previous slide. Right? So pairs consisting of one element in the closed positive unit ball and another uh, scalar strictly between zero and one with the ordering I just mentioned. And the, the family they index is simply given by the first word, right? So it's a fairly it's a somewhat trivial kind of net, if you like. Like a net officially, I guess, is really a function from your directed set to, to some elements. The function in this case is just the projection onto the first coordinate. So consider that net, well, take some, we wanna show that this you know, satisfies the key property here for, for all those elements which are in the, let's say, open positive unit ball B. So take some B, take some arbitrary epsilon greater than zero. Well, if, if you have something, you can, you can then look at the pair and that defines an element of your directed set. And if you look at all those other pairs beyond that point, right? By the definition of the relation here, this is really saying that B is almost, you know, modulo epsilon minus delta dominated by A, which, which is the same as A indexed by this, this pair, here, right? Uh, and so in other words, uh, you, you know, writing out the definition, that's saying the norm here is indeed less than or equal to epsilon minus delta, in particular, strictly less than epsilon. Right? So the, the almost domination and then creating this little uh, transitive relation or directed sets, this immediately tells you, you do indeed actually have an approximate unit 
for your C star algebra. <clears throat> so, but actually we can do we can do a little bit better than that. Like this is a this is sort of the very first, uh, I guess, general kind of loose approximate unit. But there are situations where you need to be a little bit more specific about the kind of approximate unit you have. So for one thing, you might want your approximate units to be, say, increasing with respect to the usual order on self-adjoint elements, or perhaps increasing with respect to domination as well, right? even strong. And to get these strong results, well, you need to do a, you know, a bit more analysis. So let's say, let's say we want to look at, we want to find some increasing approximate unit where if alpha is below beta in your indexing set, it should imply that the corresponding elements, A alpha uh, is also below the corresponding element, A beta. To do this, we, we show basically a kind of jewel of what we already showed, right? We, before remember, we approved a kind of uh, right approximate auxiliary result for almost domination and the, and the uh, order on your C-star algorithm. Well, here we do it the same way, except you know, we want to prove the same thing, I should say, except instead of A below B, almost dominated by C, we're going to look at A almost dominated by B below C. And the, the constants again, are the, the errors here are related by exactly the same, in the same way. And the proof is, is very similar. I probably don't even have to go through it, but again, you use this fact that for any uh, any element in the positive closure unit ball, the square is below itself. Do this, this argument just like you did before. I guess the slight difference is that now you want one minus C squared in the middle, whereas before we had A squared in the middle. And then uh, you know, apply these basic properties of, of the order to give you exactly what you want. So I can, I'll can i leave you to look at that and compare it with the other proof uh, if, you, if you don't believe me. So how do we get these these increasing approximate units then, increasing with respect to the canonical order. Well, now we consider a, an even simpler net, right? We know that, that the open positive unit ball is directed. So we can just consider all those elements indexed by themselves, right? In this case, the, the, uh, you know, the, the relation defining directedness is, is just exactly the same as the ordering on the open unit, positive unit ball. Okay, well, certainly, <laughs> sort of obvious, like A, A being below B certainly says that the corresponding elements just now with their little indices involved, uh, again, the same relation holds. I mean, yeah, it's, it's trivial. Uh, so, so this is trivially increasing. The question is, is it really uh, an approximate unit? Okay, well, let's try this out. So to show it's an approximate unit, I have to look at some arbitrary epsilon greater than zero and some arbitrary elements of the open unit ball, right? Uh, well, remember that we have, our result was that we can always find some other element which almost dominates that B. Okay, so, so now we're gonna look at that now as now this C here as an element of the index set. So looking at as an element of the index set, I look at all those elements beyond C in, the, in lambda, right? In the indexing set, right? Beyond in this case just means above C, right? Well, if A is above C and C almost dominates B, with low epsilon squared, then this other auxiliarity result says that A must therefore almost dominate B, much lower epsilon. In other words, this holds, which is exactly what you need to show that, that uh, these, these AAs are indeed an approximate unit. So great, we've got a slightly, slightly better approximate unit than we, we started with before. Next question is what about what about strictly increasing approximate units? So strictly in the sense that it's increasing with respect to this much stronger domination relation. Right? So we couldn't prove directedness with respect to this, but maybe we can still, you know, you get an approximate unit which is on the nose increasing with respect to domination. Okay. And the answer is uh, well, yes and no. It, it is true if A is small enough in some sense. I mean, I think it was, as far as I'm aware, it was actually a, an open problem until quite recently, whether you could always get an increasing approximate unit with respect to domination. 
Uh, but uh, well, some work of mine and, and my colleague Kirk Oshmita showed that that uh, if, if you have large enough A, then you can in find can indeed find some C star arguments without these strictly increasing approximately. Okay, but how do we do? What about the positive result? How do we do? Let's say separable C star arguments. Right? Separable, remember, meaning you just have some countable dense set. So this. Then indeed, it is always possible to find some strictly increasing approximate units. I'm not exactly sure who this is due to actually. I think I wouldn't be surprised if it was, I saw a paper by Kuntz in the seventies, but then again, maybe maybe it was already known by someone like Ackerman or Pedersen or, or you know, one of these other uh, you know, classic c charge breaks. But anyway, I think it was seventies, maybe even earlier that, that you get this result. So to prove this, just take some, some dense subset in, the, the open positive unit ball, right? And now we're gonna fix some elements and I'm gonna attain some element just by summing all those dNs together, right? And of course I can't just sum them as they are. I have to introduce some scalars here, these two to the negative ends, just to ensure that the sum actually converges, right? Okay. And we're in a C-star algebra, right? Which is one of the key properties is it's complete. It's a Banach space, right? So, so the sum converges, there is indeed a limit, A. Okay, now, now consider some collection of functions, let's say Fn on 0, 1, or at least at least on the spectrum of A, which we know is contained within 0, 1, because A is in the closed positive unit ball. So take some functions. Again, I'm not going to specify exactly what the function should do. I'm just going to specify the properties I need. So I need it to be 0 at the origin. I need it to... Uh, I need to be zero, in fact, not just at the origin, but for some open interval around the origin. So I want it to be zero uh, whenever X is somewhere between zero and two to the negative N minus one. Uh, and I want it to be one, so from some point beyond that. Let me see, have I, okay, I think I've, I think what I've said is not possible here, right? Because I've said it, I want it, I'm making it jump immediately from zero to one. It needs to be some gap. So I think this should really be, two to the negative n and two to the negative n plus one or something like this, right? Or maybe fours here or something. Uh, maybe it's better if I draw a picture just to tell you the idea, right? So, so the idea is that again, let's, let's look at some, something here. So one of your functions will be zero up until a certain point. Maybe it's better if I use a different color here. Okay, so it'll be zero up until a certain point. Then it will sort of increase quickly to go up to one and then it will again plateau out and will be exactly one that point onwards. So let's say, uh, let's see. So it should be should be one and should be one. Okay, uh, and that's that's one of your functions, right? And then at the next level, you want uh, you want to have another function which is again zero up until some point, but then increases quickly, and it has to hit one. At, at exactly this point, or at least, or even a little bit before if you want. And then again, plateaus out and is exactly one from that point onwards. That's the idea. And you, you know, you keep going ad infinitum, right? So the next guy would be like uh, zero up here and then, and then again, plateauing out to one, right, et cetera. Okay, so hopefully that's clear. So the, the idea is that, that, you know, this is, this is F, uh, I know, F, one, let's say, and then this, the next one is F2. Like it's hard drawing on a touchpad, and this would be F3, right? And et cetera, et cetera. The idea is that F1 is dominated by F2, which is then dominated by F3, et cetera, et cetera, right? Just in the, the usual sense in the C0 algebra of functions on the interval zero to one, right? And incidentally, it has to be, it has to be zero at the origin because Otherwise, when you when you look at the function, you know the continuous functional calculus, and you look at f of of a this element here, uh, you want it to again lie in the algebra, right? If if you if it had a non-zero value at, at at zero, then it would only be in the unitization; it wouldn't be in the algebra itself. And the whole point is we don't want to to add a unit; we want to work in the algebra a itself. Okay, so hopefully that's clear uh, we have these functions which sort of increase getting dominated etc 
as I said, this is the property you really need, even though this is not strictly speaking true from what I've written there. And if this holds, well, then it, this ensures that when you apply the continuous functional calculus to this A, you again get something which is you know, increasing with respect to domination. So it's increasing. Is it really an approximate unit? Well, it is an approximate unit for the DNs that you started with, right? Because certainly two to the minus N DN, because it appears in this sum here, it has to definitely be below A. And A is going to be almost dominated by FMA for, for M sufficiently large. You can make this as small as you like, this, this error here, as long as you make M uh, sufficiently large. Okay, but if, if that's true, if this is below this, then remember this approximate auxiliary result says that this has to be almost dominated by this, where you adjust the error slightly. And then again, by our previous observation, we can actually just cancel both of these to the minus n's to show that dn is almost dominated by fm of a. Uh, and as before, this is, really, this is really saying that the fmas form an approximate unit at, for this particular element dn. But this is true for all the dn's, right? And the dn's form a dense set. So you can, you can check that actually, if it's an approximate unit for some dense set, it really has to be an approximate unit for the closure. Right? So it has to be a den, uh, uh, an approximate unit for the entire uh, open or in fact closed positive unit ball and hence the whole positives and hence the entire algebra itself, just like before. So it really is an approximate unit for, uh, for the whole thing. Uh, yeah, as I said, by density, it extends to, oh, uh, is there a question? What are examples of separable, separable C sub? Well, pretty much any, oh, maybe that's not quite true. I mean, a lot of C star algebraists like to think, in fact, that all C star algebras are separable, which is definitely not true. But, uh, well, simple example, any, any finite dimensional C star algebra, for example, is separable. But also infinite dimensional C star algebras, like, for example, uh, compact operators on some infinite dimensional uh, infinite but infinite dimensional but separable Hilbert space. If you look at the compact operators, then that's that's separable. If you look at a uh, I don't know if a direct limit of finite dimensional C star algebras, for example, that's an AF algebra, and all AF algebras are going to be they're going to be separable as well. Yeah, I mean a lot of a lot of the algebras that people deal with, particularly in what's known as the the C star algebra classification program, they will all be separable. So. If you want, I guess maybe a, maybe an even better question would be what's a non-separable C star algebra? So an example, the simplest example of a non-separable C star algebra would be look, to look at all operators, uh, all bounded operators on some separable infinite dimensional Hilbert space. Right? Even though this, the, the, the Hilbert space is separable, if you look at arbitrary operators on that space, then you no longer have a separable space. If you restrict the compacts, yes, but if you look at arbitrary ones, no. Right? You can also take quotients. You can take the quotient by the compact. You get the calcanada, that's another non separable thing. Right? So, yeah. I mean, and also, what's another thing to point out? That if you're looking at commutative C star algebras, so all those are the form, you know, C of X, C0 of X for some you know, locally compact space X, then separability of the C star algebra corresponds precisely to second countability of the underlying space. So take any locally compact uh, Hausdorff second countable space and the complex valued functions on that will be a, a separable commutative C star algebra. So does that, uh, yeah, does that answer, answer your question? <laughs> yep, okay, great. Uh, so yep, so this works for all separable C star algebras and just a little, uh, well, advertisement, I guess, that uh, that actually even can be extended to C star algebras which have a dense subset of size Aleph 1. So this is not countable. Aleph 1 here is the first uncountable cardinal, if, you're, if you know a bit of you know, elementary cardinality or set, set theory here. So, so you can extend it sort of one level above countable, right? But you can't extend it any further, which is somewhat surprising, right? It's, it's weird that that's where the boundary lies. And this is this is some result, some, well, relative, I guess, recent work of me and a colleague of mine, Peter Koshmita. So yeah, this is, yeah, it's somewhat surprising. But the, the proof in the Aleph 1 case, so to, to get to this next level, that is much more, uh, much more difficult, right? You have to, 
at least at least as far as we know like the proof that we had was like you know at least a page of you know fairly uh technical calculations using the continuous functional calculus but, but it can be done okay so i guess we're getting getting close to finishing up what was i going to talk about i was going to talk about a hereditary c star sub algebras i guess okay i guess i can just just introduce hereditary c star sub -outers. so so a c star sub algebra is just a closed you know star sub algebra of the original c star algebra a that you have okay but there are a very special kind of c star sub algebra called a yeah so this should really be c star sub algebra here at the top of a very special ones called hereditary so and it, and you could talk about hereditary you know arbitrary sets if you like so hereditarity means heredity just means that whenever you have some positive element below something which you know is in your your set b or your c star c star sub algebra b then you further require that a itself also has to lie within b that's the heredity property uh, there are actually some other more algebraic characterizations, and indeed there are, well, at first at least, some nice algebraic properties of hereditary C star subalgebra. So if you have some hereditary C star subalgebra, and you have some other elements, and you know it can be expressed as a product of something, something from A and something from B on the right, as well as something from A and something from B on the left, then, then in fact it already had to lie within B. So it's another sort of similar kind of condition. So, uh, so what do you do? Well, take some, take some positive element. Okay, and first note that, that we can kind of get a, I guess a restricted version of this by looking at products of the form B A plus B. So it's, so this is, if you look at something of this form then definitely it's of this form, right? You can look at it as B times the right-hand side or you can look at it B times the left-hand side, right? So it's definitely within here. And so if this is to be true, then it should lie within B. So this is kind of a baby version of that. So can we prove that? Well, yes, we can. Because look at this, well, take any, any positive element A and note that, well, this is definitely positive. Mm -hmm. And because A is below a scalar multiple of one, where the scalar is just the norm of A, well, this tells you that it's just a below some scalar multiple of B squared, right? And if B is a hereditary, if B is a C star algebra, right? Or hereditary C star sub algebra, but even just a C star algebra, it has to be closed under products and scalar multiples. So that has to be within B. Hereditarity tells you that this also then has to lie within B. Yeah, and it looked as if we we're only proving this for positive elements, but actually this, it's positive A here, but actually it extends to arbitrary A because of this decomposition result. Remember that any element of A can be expressed as some positive element minus some other positive element. Okay, so that means from the result we've proved, any element here can be expressed as some element of B minus again, some, some element of B. But B is a C star algebra, so it has to be closed under, under you know, additive inverses and, and sum, so it's closed under subtraction. So this again has to lie within B. Okay, now let's go for the, the big result. So let's take some arbitrary now element, which is just in, in this thing here. Right? Well, we know that we can always find an approximate unit for our hereditary C star sub algebra B here. And now we just look at this expression here, C minus B lambda C B lambda. So, so these guys are of this nice form, right? They're of the form B times a positive element. Uh, well, not quite positive, right? Oh, not, not B times, they're, they're of this form here. B times some element times B, right? So, okay, we know these at least all lie within B, uh, but we want to show that actually these approach C and because B is closed, that will imply C is also going to lie within B. So we just do some you know, little trickery. We take away B lambda C, add B lambda C, apply subadditivity. Um, then, then we note that C on the one can can be written on the form B A, right? This is by assumption here. C has to lie within B A. So we can write it in this form. On the other hand, we can write it as A prime B, some potentially different elements, right? Which still nonetheless lie within A and B respectively. And again, do a bit of submultiplicativity. Okay, now these, these have to, I mean, they could be large, but, but they have to, this A, A prime and A here, they have to be fixed, right? 
So if these expressions approach zero here, well, we know the whole expression has to approach zero. And these, these approach zero recall because B lambda is an approximate unit for all the elements of B. Okay, so this, this does indeed hold. These are in B, so any limit has to be in the closure, which is within B by assumption, right? A C star subalgebra has to be closed. So this shows that A, A, B, the section B, A is a subset of B. And I guess I, yeah, I really should be finishing up. So, um, okay, I, here is, this is kind of a converse saying that, okay, if you have a C star subalgebra B and you know this holds, then in fact, uh, in fact, uh, B, what's it? Uh, it's really odd. Oh, so that if this holds, then in fact, it has to be hereditary. So I won't go through the proofs there. I just wanted to show you this last result. So I won't go into the proof again, but uh, the idea is that, that hereditarity here has a, a few different more algebraic characterizations. So, so this order theoretic characterization, the original one actually turns out to be equivalent, right? We just showed that one implies two, but actually it turns out it's equivalent to saying anything of this form has to lie within B. It's equivalent to saying whenever you multiply by B on either side, uh, that again, has to lie within B, or again, you can restrict it like so. So this, I guess, I guess the interesting thing I think is three, because it's sort of, sort of like saying B is an ideal, but it's not, it's not necessarily a left ideal or a right ideal, definitely not a two-sided ideal, but it's a, it's what sometimes in semi-group theory called a bi ideal. So, so you can take an arbitrary element and multiply both on the left and the right, right? And and that will have to get you back into B. Uh, two is also sometimes in semi-group theory called a, I think a notion of a quasi idea. So so when you're looking at C star subalgebras, being hereditary is the same as being a quasi ideal is the same as being a bi ideal. Right? Uh, but these are very different from being a left ideal or a uh, two sided ideal. Right? But I can well I or or Karen can talk about this more next week. So thank you, thank you for your time. I think that's that's about it for today. Any any questions? Doesn't uh, doesn't look like it. I mean, just just unmute mute yourself if you if you'd like to ask anything. Nope. Okay. Well, thanks again, and uh, hopefully see you next week.